All right, we've already looked at the bell states. The four bell states are given as phi plus minus 1 minus 2. And if these bell states are written in the horizontal vertical basis, we have this thing. Likewise, we can make the other superpositions in which the orthogonal polarizations are coupled together in this fashion. So these four states generally qualify as the Bell states. And we looked at some interesting properties and we look at further properties. So this, these are entangled states and these kinds of two spin or two qubit entangled states are called the Bell states. They could be high order entangled states as well. For example, this state for three qubits or three spin half particles is also an entangled state. Though it's not called a bell state because these are the four bell states. This is generally called a GHZ state. GHZ state. Green by the on xylemid state and so on. Now what is an entangled state? <coughs> Suppose I have a bipartite system and I have a vector psi which can be written as a tensor product of some state for the first particle and some state for the second particle. And such a state which can be written as a tensor product or a direct product of some state for the first particle and some state for the second particle is called a non-entangled state or a separable state. Okay, this is non-entangled. However, a state such as this one that cannot be factorized into some state for the first particle, the tensor with some state for the second particle is called an entangled state. For example, let's look at the Bell state, phi plus 1 over 2, 2 h h plus d b. Now this state, no matter how hard you try, cannot be written as a tensor product of the first qubit of, of the first particle with the second particle. It's impossible to factorize this. Thing. Okay? If you had a state like this, H H plus V H one over hundred, then this is indeed a separable state because what you could have written is that this state could have been written as a superposition of the first qubit of the first particle tensor with the state of the second part. So here now you have some <coughs> state for the first part which is the phi here and you have some state for the second part which is the time here. So this state is not an entangled state because it has been written in the form of a tensor product of a ket for the first particle and a ket for the second particle. In fact, you can also prove that this state, no matter what coefficients you choose, no matter how hard you try, cannot be written in as a tensor product of two gets. Okay. So this is how we define an entangled state. <coughs> However, <coughs> let's look at concept of mixed and pure states. Mixed versus pure states. <coughs> so far in all of the quantum mechanics we studied, we've been studying pure quantum states. Those quantum states can, that can be represented by gets or vectors. Sorry. We have only looked at states in this kind. 
But these states have only an idealization. Okay. Now suppose I have an incoming photon which is in some arbitrary state and I have a polarization analyzer that projects onto H and B. Okay? So there are two possible outcomes. You can get plus one or minus one, these are four outcomes. When you get plus one, you project it onto the state get H and when you get B, you project it onto the state get B. Alright? Now suppose you input cat uh, H. A single photon comes in which is in this state. This photon, this channel will fire. Okay. Always. If you input a photon that is polarized at 45 degrees, really polarized. Okay. This 45 degrees polarized photon is basically a superposition of cat H and cat B. Okay. So what's going to happen is this channel will fire half of the times and this channel will fire half of the times. Okay. What do I mean by half of the times? How do I know that it's going to fire half of the times? I will need multiple copies of this in, of this incoming photon. Only then I will be able to build up this probability distribution. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now suppose I have, I do something different. I have an analyzer that is oriented along the 45 degree axis. For example, I do this external axis. And I input photons that are coming in at 45 degrees. Now this get 45 degrees is an equal superposition of get A and get so what's going to happen if I have two possible outcomes, plus one and minus one, which channel is going to fire? Plus one. The plus one channel is going to fire all the time. Now this 45 degrees is an equal superposition. We say that this 45 degrees, this 45 degrees input state can be written in any basis you like. And you, since you're analyzing the plus 45 minus 45 degree basis, one of the channels. The probability that this channel is going to fire is the input polarization 45 degrees and the eigenstate corresponding to this eigenvalue. Okay. Uh, so the eigenvalue is plus one of the polarization operator. So you get 45 degrees here. You take the modulus square of this inner product, this is one. Right? This is the bond postulate of one. Now suppose instead of inputting this polarization, right, this is a, a single photon comes in, but in order to build up the statistics you need multiple copies. Okay, this is the nature of quantum mechanics. This kind of superposition is basically a coherent superposition. Coherent superposition means that it can be written as a cat. And it's a superposition because there is some phase factor here some relative phase factor between these basis states. Okay. And it's coherent. Okay. The way it has been prepared is you could have a single A. So there is some description of preparing this input state. For example, you could have a horizontally polarized photon. You could pass it through a half A plate that is oriented at 45, that is oriented at 22.5 degrees and the output would be an equal superposition. Okay? Or you could have an input of photon which was horizontally polarized into a beam splitter. And one of the arms would give you an equal superposition like this. So you, you had a prescription and experimental procedure of preparing this coherent state. Okay. Now suppose what happens is you have the same polarization analyzer, but that is oriented at 45 degrees. You have an incoming stream of photons. You have two possible channels at the output. Now the incoming stream of photons is not a coherent superposition. Let's see how you can make 
a different kind of incoming stream of photons. <coughs> Suppose uh, suppose you have incoming photons polarized at 45 degrees okay. and then you have a half wave frame. A half wave plate whose axis can be oriented at 22.5 degrees or it can be oriented at 77.5 degrees. And this half wave plate is such that it randomly changes its uh, op optical axis. Sometimes it has 22.5 degrees and half of the time it has 77.5 degrees. So whenever a photon comes in, it sees a different half wave plate. The orientation of its optic axis is different. And this is controlled by some random number generator. Okay. This is controlled by a random number generator. The random number generator is such that it outputs zeros and ones randomly and whenever the output is zero the optic axis is at 20.5 whenever it is one the optic axis is 7, 7. so what will be the outcome of stream of four counts what the half wave plate does is just it rotates the linear polarization it either projects it onto zero degrees or onto nine degrees so it is creating a stream of horizontal and vertical polarization Okay. At one time, indeed a single photon is coming in into this polarization analyzer. So it's a single photon experiment, but there are multiple copies and they are not really copies. Half of them on average will be get H and half of them on average will be get H. Okay. So now I would like to write, represent this state. Okay. Let's call this state rho. Okay. Now, Without telling what the state, how do I represent this state? What would be the possible outcomes? Asad, kya outcomes? Sir, a mixture of H and V. Mixture of H and V, kya hota? Sir, kuch H hoonge, kuch V hoonge, but we can't exactly tell it. Yungha, hamayin pata kya, kis, kus point pe kya? Ito, kis ki output kya hoonge? Is this value kya output kya? Which of the channels are going to fight? Sir, this is the same thing, half of the time you plus one fire, half of the time minus one fire. Right. So half of the time this will fire and half of the time this will fire. Okay. If a cat H comes in, even then the probability that this will fire is half, this will fire is half. If a cat B comes in, the probability that this is fire is half, this fire is half. Okay. However, how do I represent this state? This state is no longer a coherent superposition of cat H plus cat B because if you input set a cat H such a superposition into this analyzer, only this channel is going to fire. So this state is clearly different from this state. And it's not a superposition of cat H. So this state has been prepared differently. And it is impossible to write this state as a cat. Okay? Impossible. You cannot write this as a cat that lives in a Hilbert space. It is an incoherent mixture. Okay. So this incoherent mixture is now not represented by a cat. Rather, it's represented by an operator. How do you prepare this state? You prepare this state by taking cat H half of the times. So what you would make is the outer product cat H plus H. 
and you could also have made cat b. So you take the outer product of the state that you prepare with itself and write the probability in front of it. I mean the fraction in the mixture. Half that half with half probability you prepare the state cat b and with half the probability you prepare the state cat h. Now this of course is an operator, it's not a cat. It's not the product, it's an operator. This operator is called the density operator.
Now there are certain cancellations that can be done. H, E, this goes away. Okay. And I am left with half H, H plus B, B, which is the same as rho 1. Now, there are two different preparation schemes. Okay? In one scheme, I have taken half of the photon to be horizontally polarized, half of the photon to be vertically polarized. This is a different preparation scheme. Half of the photons are 45 degrees polarized, half of them were orthogonally polarized at minus 45 degrees. I can take any other, any two orthogonal states in the block sphere. Get n. And half of this plus half of n normal, right? The orthogonal state. Okay. Where you know what the general quantum state on the block sphere is. Okay. So the general quantum state is given by cosine theta by 2 get h plus e i phi sine theta by 2. Right? You can construct the orthogonal state of this as well. So I can take any two orthogonal states and make an equal incoherent mixture. I will get the same density operator. So different preparation schemes will give me different, uh, the same, may give me the same density operator for mixed states. This is called the ensemble fallacy. Ensemble fallacy the literature of quantum information. Ensemble fallacy means you have different ensembles which have been prepared differently but they give the same density operator. So if you input, but what remains at the end is the density operator. And this density operator will be will determine what the measurement outcomes are. Okay? So different preparation schemes can give you different density operators, uh, can give you the same density operator. And the density of the determines what the measurement outcomes are. So those different preparation schemes can use similar measurement outcomes because the density of the is. In other words, there are infinite number of, way, of ways of decomposing a density, of, of decomposing a mixed density of Okay? So this is called in some, this is a very important subject. Now, let me look at some, uh, for pure quantum states, sorry, we know that if you would like to find the probability of obtaining a certain measurement outcome, so if we have a, a Hermitian observable A or O, okay, and the corresponding eigenstate is denoted by lambda, the eigenvalue is lambda, okay. The probability of obtaining this eigenvalue as a measurement outcome is of course given by the projection of the state onto the corresponding eigenstate or the square. Okay? This is the probability of obtaining lambda as the outcome. And you've already noticed that this is just the expectation value of the projection operator. In last in the previous lecture, we noted that this is just the expectation value of the projection operator onto the corresponding eigenstate. So it's just the expectation value of the projection operator on the corresponding eigenstate. Right? It, in other words, it's just the expectation value of this operator in the corresponding state, right? The probability is just the expectation value of the projection operator. Okay. Now this is just a bone posture. Okay. I mean one minute. So I would 
like to define now what is called the trace of any operator. Trace. It's a term that is borrowed from linear algebra. You all know what trace is. If I take an operator A and I would like to find the trace of this operator T R, I will just take the inner product of this operator. I will form this inner product psi i, psi i, and sum up over all the i's where the psi i form an orthonormal basis. In other words, the sum of the outer products psi i. Right? If this is true, then this operation is called the trace operation. If I write an operator in matrix form, it will be diagonal in its eigenbasis. Correct? So the trace would then simply mean the sum of its diagonal elements. Okay? So if an operator is written in its eigenbasis, then it's diagonal. Then the trace is the sum of its diagonal elements. Okay. So the trace is the sum of its diagonal elements. When it, the operator is written in its eigenbasis, which means when the operator is diagonal itself. So this is the property of this is the trace operation. Now let's look at this property. What does this property really mean? Uh, this property. <coughs> Is this row a remission operator? Yes, it's a remission operator. Row dagger is equal to no. Transmission operator. You can just look at, at the formula and you can find out its emission operator. So its eigenvalues are real. Alright. Now if I take this means any emission operator can be spectrally decomposed. Correct? You can form a spectral decomposition of any emission operator. Suppose the spectral decomposition is nothing but so these are the eigenstates, the lambda i's are the eigenstates, and these are the corresponding eigenvalues. This is the spectral decomposition. Okay. Now if I take the trace of this operator. Taking the trace of this operator is simply the sum of the eigenvalues. So I can form this, these inner products, right, for this operator. And what will I be left with? I will just be left out with the sum of the pi's, the sum of the probabilities. And this is equal to 1. Okay? So the density operator has certain properties. All its eigenvalues which are the values that are the coefficients of the spectral decomposition, they are real, because it's a condition of it. Okay? And these correspond to probabilities, so they can only be zero or positive. Okay? It's a remission. So the density operator is a remission operator, all its eigenvalues are real, they are semi-definite positive, which means zero or positive. Okay? And the trace of this operator is always 1. So this is the property of the density operator. Okay. This property of the density operator is just similar to the normalization property of, of a pure quantum state. Okay. Now if I know the density, if I if I knew the uh, density operator, <coughs> which means I know the state. So the density operator is 
in this spectrum of whether we have a pure or a mixed state. For a mixed state, we can write an energy operator, and so can we do for a for a pure state. Just you can. Suppose I have an operator K and I want to find an expectation value of this observable. Okay, so it's an observable. Okay, A is an observable. I want to find the expectation value of this observable. So I have this. Uh, expect, this is what I would like to find. Okay. Now A, the, if we have a mixed state, which means that the density operator is given by Pi psi i psi i. If I would like to find the expectation value of an observable, with, if I just had a pure state, the expectation value would be A psi i. Right? This would be the expectation value. Correct? For a pure state. But now I have a mixed state. So with each state I have a probability. So what I would like to do, I would like to take this expectation value in state psi i multiply with the probability that I have the state of psi i and take the sum. Back, 
10 a bravi okay if i have this is an operator okay if i would like to find the trace of this operator okay let's look at a property of the trace okay what do i get now i use the definition i have suppose my orthogonal states are orthonormal states are represented by i's okay i i a b i some over time. Alright? Is this correct? My orthonormal basis is I've been representing this by the label I. Okay. Now this is the trace of this operator. So what do I get? I get some over I. Now these are just scalars. So I can change the order. V I I Now this means I can write bra B summation I I get A. Okay, but this is just the identity operator, so I have inner product B A B. So the trace of this operator is this this thing. In other words, what have I done here? I have taken my definition of the expectation value. I have used this a psi, right? This small tit bit, right? This formula that I have written in representing this inner product as a trace. Okay. Now remember, this is an operator, right? This is an operator. This is an operator. So all of this is an operator. The trace is the sum of its value values. Now what I can do, I can take this 
sum of the diagonal elements outside. Because what I have is just a number here, a real number pi, and I'm taking the sum. So I take the trace operation outside. When I take the trace operation outside, I will get trace of sigma i pi uh, a psi i psi i. Now remember, this is just an operator. It's being multiplied by a number. And I'm summing up over all. Oh, so these are just some operators. And it's a linear, sum is a linear function. So what I can do is instead of having to do this summation afterwards, I can take this summation into this operator. So that this operator A acts on. So instead of having to take the sum of operators, I take the operator acting on the sum. Okay? So this is what I've done here. I've taken this PI inside. This simply is a density operator and I'm left with the expectation value of any observable is given by we multiply the op operator corresponding to the observable with the density operator and take the trace. It's not as if we can equal it as acting on the cat. We can also take it acting on the bra. It's fine. So, 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 so for trace A and P commute, A and goes by. Right. So for the trace operation cycle, you can change the order, the trace does not change. And this is something for you to we'll prove this in the recitation on the question on this. Okay. So if I have any observable, the key point is that if I have any observable, I would like to find its expectation when I take the trace of the product of the observable with the density operator. This is an extremely important result. You have to remember this. Okay. Therefore, okay. Now let's look at some some application of this. Suppose I have the Bell states. Suppose I have the Bell state phi plus, which is given by 1 over under root 2 h h plus b. <coughs> I would like to find the probability that if, okay, first of all, I would like to find the probability that my signal photon is h. That is, I have this kind of arrangement in which I input the entangled state. I, right. So this is the crystal. Okay, this is my signal photon, and I pass it through the P A H B, and I would like to find out the probability that this photon that is outgoing is a horizontal photon. I don't care about the entangled photon. Okay. So I want to calculate this probability. And we know that this probability is the expectation value of a projection operator. Okay. Now what is the projection operator I am interested in? This probability is the operator the expectation value. What is the projection operator I am interested in? If I want to find the probability that this photon is going on, So what I would like to do, I, this is my observable. 
I would like to find its expectation value. So I would multiply this observable with the density of the wave. You can all do, because since this is a pure state, you can do all of this calculation without resort to density operators. But density operators makes your life easier. So let's write the density operator for this. Okay? It's quite easy. If since the density operator is just the other product of this cat with itself, I would like to implement this in some basis. Suppose I choose the horizontal vertical basis. Alright? In which there is a particular ordering of states. The ordering can be resolved to the previous class. So if I choose this ordering, my density operator this right now there are two, way, two or three ways of finding out the matrix representation I can form this outer product in the labels H, H, B, B and then I can put in the, the representation or I can simply write down the vector for this this is 1 1 2 2 1 0 0 1 so I can take this column vector here I can take the complex conjugate in no form transpose here and I can form this operator. Okay. So if you do this calculation you get half 1 0 0 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 1. So this is the density operator for the bell state for one of the bell states. Okay. Now I would like to find out the density operator for uh, the matrix representation of this projection of okay this is my A Okay. 
this is, this is what a condition probability is. Now, what is this probability equal that the I here alone is H? Half. So this is half on its own. Now you would like to calculate the probability that give that both the idler is H and the signal is H. Now for this I will need to construct the projection operator. Now the projection operator that I will construct. Now this probability will simply be given by the expectation value of a projection operator. And that projection operator is ten H graph H ten certain. H, H. Now, the matrix form of this operator is actually quite simple. It just has a one in the leading position on the back and zeros at the middle. Okay, so let's I can calculate this in the class. This probability equals the trace of 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 multiplied by half of 1 0 0 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 1 right this is equal to trace of you can take this half outside this is just the trace of 1 and 0 everywhere else so this is half so this turns out to be half. So this probability is actually equal to 1, which is actually really something. I look at the signal alone, the probability that this horizontal polarity is half. I look at the ideal alone, the probability this horizontal polarity is half. But once the ideal turns out to be horizontally polarized, the signal, if you measure the outcome, it's always going to be horizontally polarized. Now these two photons that are generated in, a, in an entangled, entangled experiment. So I input a single photon, proper polarization, I get two photons. The joint state of the system is 5 plus, it's an entangled state. If I measure the polarization of this photon, Suppose it turns out to be horizontally polarized. Now there is a 50% probability whether it turns out to be horizontally or vertically polarized. Remember. But if it turns out to be horizontally polarized, I don't need to make a measurement on this photon. The outcome of this photon is completely determined by the outcome of a measurement experiment of this photon. If this is vertically polarized, which is totally random because it can switch randomly between horizontal and vertical, it automatically fixes the measurement outcome on the second and these photons can be separated light years away. There can be no physical communication between these photons. The experimenter here cannot communicate any signal to this experiment. The outcome is instantaneous. It's action at a distance. Okay? So there is no way of communication. Even if there were, the outcome is instantaneous. So this is totally random. And this is totally random on its own. If you don't know, but one measurement outcome is fixing the outcome on the other photon. This in time, this cannot be explained to us. In fact, Einstein's 1935 paper with Podolsky and Rosen, he was highly uncomfortable with this, with this scheme. He said that how can a measurement outcome fix the properties of the system? That this is photon is horizontally polarized, dependent upon an experiment that has happened elsewhere. And there's no formal physical link between these experiments. How can that outcome determine? So he proposed exotic models that there are some hidden variables which always will be hidden from that determine the properties of the system and we can't see them. 1964, Bell countered this idea and resolved this apparent paradox. Since Einstein couldn't understand this, he called it a paradox. It's not really a paradox. Quantum mechanics does explain how can we observe such non-local -lo behavior. Okay. So the density matrix operator formalism actually simplifies all of this, all of these calculations. Okay. Now I would like to come present one more example of the density operator. Yeah, that's 
well. Now, let's call this experiment of Alice. And let's call this experiment of Bob. Now, if Bob makes a measurement, and he chooses to measure in the horizontal vertical basis, he has to choose a basis instead. If he chooses to measure in the horizontal vertical basis, and he gets some outcome, that outcome completely determines what Alice's outcome is, providing she measures in the same basis. One experiment performed by Bob, one by Alice. If Alice performs that experiment before Bob, <laughs> if she measures in the horizontal vertical basis, gets an outcome, that completely determines what Bob will measure. So timing is not important. However, if Bob measures in the horizontal vertical basis and Alice measures in the 45 minus 45, then the outcome will be totally different. You can prove this using all of these formulas. And the beauty is that if Bob chooses to measure in plus 45 minus 45 basis, and Alice also chooses to measure in 45 minus 45 basis, so they have agreed on this, and then take their photons away and go to far off distances, and Bob makes the measurement in 45 minus 45 basis. Alice, even then, the outcome is perfectly correlated. So it does not measure, does this outcome does not depend upon the basis. In Probability calculator idler is 45 degrees. Idler is 45 degrees, signal is 45 degrees. You will still get one. So no matter what basis you choose, if both of them are measuring the same basis, if they are analyzing the polarization of photon in the same basis, they will get this out of the perfect correlate. If you have the other state, the psi state, which is H B plus B H or H B minus B H, then there will be perfect anti-correlation. If this photon is measured to the horizontal polarity, this photon will be measured to the vertical polarity and vice versa. I have said that if there are four bell states, phi or psi, psi is H B plus minus B H, there will be perfect anti-correlation. If this photon is not measured to be horizontal, this will be measured. But if this is measured to be cat uh, n, this will be measured to be the orthonormal cat n. Okay. So this outcome is measurement in a uh, basis independent.
But then there is perfect correlation between these outcomes. This is the hallmark of entanglement, which cannot be explained us. It is a correlation, a quantum correlation that cannot be explained us. Okay. Now I would like to finish off this lecture in the next 2-3 minutes by introducing the thermal state. Now suppose I have an ensemble. Okay, ensemble means multiple spins, multiple particles, n particles, large number of them. Okay, I would like to write a density matrix for this ensemble. Remember, if I just pick up one particle at random from that ensemble, it will still have the same density matrix. Okay, ये बात याद रखनी है. ठीक है और यहाँ पे ना philosophical interpretation बहुत आता है. Quantum mechanics. कि how we represent states. If I have the thermal state, statistical mechanics tells us that the density operator for this state is going to be 1 over the partition function z into exponent minus the Hamiltonian kVt. The kVt is the temperature factor, kVt is the open mass. Okay. And this partition function z is simply given by the trace of T minus H over K. Okay. So this is the thermal state. Uh, okay. Now if <coughs> the Hamiltonian H, of course it's an addition operator. Okay, so we can spectrally decompose. And it, what are its eigenstates? Its eigenstates are just the energy eigenstates. And what are the eigenvalues? The energy eigenvalues. Suppose this Hamiltonian is has a non-degenerate discrete spectrum. Then this Hamiltonian can be written as E i E i plus. Right? This is the spectral decomposition. So I can put this Hamiltonian in here. Okay. So, so the density operator rho is given as 1 over z e minus
maximum voltage distribution. Okay. So this is the thermal state, uh, the density operator for the thermal state, and these are just the probabilities of finding an energy E m for the system, given a, given a temperature. E. Now in next class on Monday what we will start off with is the fact that we will use this thermal state and find out the magnetization of an ensemble of spins. Find out the parametric So if you do your mobile several ideas will become clear and there will be more questions for you to probe in the recitation. Next Wednesday we're going to have a quiz on the concept of density operators and in time. Next week, we'll also going to start our resolution of the EPR paradox. We're going to talk about the Bell's inequalities, the CHSH inequalities, what is non-locality. We're going to spend a couple of minutes on that. Okay.